Hey everybody, uh, my name is Brandon. Happy Friday, Junior. I'm um, excited to be here chatting about Gen AI and whether or not you should invest in it. Um, I'm gonna jump right into the presentation and then folks can trickle in as they, as they arrive. Um, the recording will be available, I believe it'll be made available to you guys afterwards. Um, so yeah. folks should be able to catch up on the whole thing. Um, all right, so appreciate you guys showing up. My name is Brandon. I am head of engineering at Concurrency. Um, really, I'm responsible for the, the P&L of our group. And then also uh, on the, the more fun side of the, the house, uh, the technical design and implementation of the, the software that we design and implement for, for customers. Concurrency is a professional services org in the Microsoft ecosystem. We build enterprise um, AI-enabled applications to solve various problems, typically for manufacturers, um, retailers, financial services, and healthcare. Um, but we've we've worked across other industries too. My background, and then we'll get to more interesting things outside of myself, um, is applied math and um, software. I've been doing this for about ten years um, before. Concurrency, I led AI at uh, another vendor in the in the space called Three Cloud. Before that was, um, I led machine learning at Publix, a Florida-based grocery store. Before that was in R and D at um, Kroger, um, and worked in financial services, uh, doing algorithmic marketing and so on um, at Fisher Investments. But we are here to talk about Gen AI and why you shouldn't invest in it. And that's a sort of provocative framing. Um, and I'm doing that because, as you guys might have noticed, the data industry is filled with a lot of hype right now, and often creating value with AI tech can feel like a scavenger hunt. Um, and that's often perpetuated by vendors, um, depicted as this little raccoon here, uh, who who claim to be experts in all kinds of stuff just in the interest of expanding market share and so on. And I think that can be really problematic from, it can be problematic if you're a serious engineering executive um, or leader in IT who just wants a very frank discussion on what you can do with Gen AI and what you can't do. Um, everybody's familiar with this hype cycle and um, we're, <laughs> We're definitely riding the wave um, with generative AI, and that's not necessarily bad um, if you can cut through the hype. And that's really what I wanted to do um, today, um, because if you don't, you're left with really all of these problems, um, which are you don't know what the ROI is or could be with with Gen AI. You don't know what the production workloads could be. You don't know where you should use it. Um, you don't know how hard it would be to implement um, should you decide to do it. And that can be really frustrating, especially since there aren't known solutions to that with new technology, right? Um, how you typically go about making technology choices with, with the various frameworks that exist usually don't help. Um, Different industries have different ways of thinking about how they invest in technology. Um, and, and importantly, there's a talent gap, right? Um, LLMs have been around for a while, but popularly for the last two years. And you, that means you have two years of, uh, of runway for people to have developed expertise in it. And, um, you know, mastery of a complicated domain like generative AI takes a long time. And, there's a dearth of talent basically that that can actually deliver this stuff. So all of these issues really uh, converge on why I think you shouldn't invest in generative AI. But if I were to say that more specifically, it's not it's not that you shouldn't. It's it's what you should build, what you should buy, and where you should partner. Right um, out of the gate, I think people feel in my experience clients have articulated that they feel like they need to invest in this technology lest they be left behind and there is a a spirit of truth to that 
but then there's a good deal of noise um, that could really lead you lead you astray. And so I've tried to kind of develop a framework to help think about um, this really important decision on on where to build and whether that's internally or with a partner and what you should just buy off the shelf, if at all. And so today, my goal really is threefold. I want you guys to learn something useful. Um, I hope that you stop thinking about build versus buy, and hopefully you have a path forward wherever you are. Um, and so we'll get, we'll get rolling. Um, feel free to leave questions in the chat. Um, I believe that should be turned on. Um, but let's, uh, let's dive in. So remember this, this, uh, scavenger hunter, um, this AI vendor basically trying to help organizations create value with AI, but everybody's an expert. You can do everything all the time, always with AI. Um, that makes it really hard to navigate the landscape. And that's why we need a map to help us, help us do this. And so I'm going to unpack um, this map uh, because it's it's how I reason through technology choices and it's how I help our clients reason through technology choices, specifically around um, generative AI um, and other AI applications, right? Whether it's um, demand planning, you're forecasting things or um, next best action systems where you're trying to uh, make intelligent moves in the face of constraints um, or other sort of NLP applications. Uh, regardless, this map helps you reason through technology choices um, across the board. And so um, this is really what a what the map looks like. This is, um, there's a lot going on on this picture and I'm gonna unpack it in the following slides, but um, importantly, you have two axes um, that you can basically use to characterize um, technology. And so where you put it on the map, um basically lets you conclude what you should do should you build it should you buy it should you um partner with a a partner to build it and so on the bottom axis the horizontal one you have the technology maturity basically how evolved is it is it is it not even invented right that's all the way down in the the vertex here um all the way to the the far right which would be this is a utility service, right? It's It's been around forever. Um, there's essentially no risk. It's very cheap. It's a commodity, right? So this is technology maturity on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, you have the, the visibility and the value chain um, that the technology is. And so this is, you know, at the top, you have very visible stuff, right? Think of like a, a UI or an interface of some kind. Um, or something that touches users that they um, can interact with, right? So this would be any kind of um, like basic application. On the bottom here, you have things that are um, invisible, right? Uh, basically very far removed from end users. It's not kind of, it's not clear what its utility is. And in the space of the actual graph here, um, or map rather, you have different interpretations on um, how to think of that technology, right? And so um, if you were to draw a line horizontally across, you uh, that would represent the sort of minimally accepted return on a technology project that you need to justify investing in it, right? That's sort of like the minimum. Now, obviously you don't wanna do things below that, um, and that changes a lot, especially how given how mature it is. Um, I'm going to skip over. I'm going to I'm going to move away from this slide. I, I sense that it might be a little too abstract. I'm going to talk about an actual example here. So, um, think of a, a manufacturer who is who builds widgets, and they need to manage their supply chain that you know takes raw materials in they do some manufacturing of them are on them and then they you know sell it sell the output right the widgets now they need to manage that supply chain their inventory and so um they need a demand planning system and 
uh, they they want to dress this demand planning system up to be sort of next generation. So they kind of wrap it in a, a large language model, right? To to allow interfacing with that system via uh, a chat chatbot interface, right? So you kind of have generative AI being married with sort of legacy AI um, in this system. Now, the question is, should you build this internally? Should you partner with somebody to, to build it for you? Or should you just buy something off the shelf? And this map um, is gonna walk us through how to answer those questions. So in basically plotted on this graph are system components that are needed in order to create this generative AI demand planning system. Uh, you need forecasts of the widgets, right? How many widgets are am I going to need in the next week? Um, you need what's called explainability, uh, which is allowing users to understand why those forecasts are the forecasts. Why did the system uh, make those decisions? You need you know certain business logic, right? To uh, to filter to the right result set and just do regular uh, processing, business business logic processing. Um, and then of course you need you need data to go into it. That data requires ETL and the 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 forecasting model that produces the forecasts uh, that requires ML ops, right? Just automated governance. Um, all of that requires a platform. Uh, and you know there's and then there's more data that you need right so what's highlighted in red are the the ai components of this now very faintly um and sort of masked is all of the other um all the other components that are not ai um but i'm pointing these out to just highlight how th they're dependent on each other um and where they're at in the map or on the map so forecasts those are very visible um users interact with those forecasts. Uh, those forecasts are, and, and um, also they're new, right? They are a, forecasts are, need to be created with every new system, right? And so for that reason, they're a sort of low maturity um, sort of component to the system. And that produces some risk, right? Cause it's, you know, if it were a utility, it's it's less risky. It's tried and true, but these forecasts you don't know, you don't know how good they're going to be until you until you make them. Explain you don't get those forecasts without explainability. Explainability is less less visible, but um, it's a little more mature. Business logic. This is um, usually behind the wall, um, but still influences the experience and the data that the users. C, um, and so it kind of slides down the visibility uh, axis. And also this is typically custom built, right? It's, you can't like go buy, um, you know, a business's business logic sort of module or something. Um, the data, um, there's really, there's really five different um, data inputs to, to any, any demand planning system. And that's pricing data. Um, historical demand data. So think of how many widgets were purchased, uh, you know, historically, that's the thing you're trying to predict. Um, you have taxonomy data, where those widgets fit in the sort of product catalog. You know, is it, if you're a furniture manufacturer, is it a couch or is it a, you know, love seat or is it a chair? Is it a, is it a bed? Um, that kind of stuff. And then you have weather data and calendar data. Now, each of these data sets occupy a different space on the map. Um, this data down here is relatively invisible and it's usually custom built, the taxonomy, historic data and price data, because this is unique to an organization. And so the, the code and the logic, the what's called the feature engineering um, required to make sense of this data is all, it's all bespoke. Um, that's why it's in this custom built section. Weather data and calendar data this is much, much more commoditized and it's also more visible. Um, in my experience, having, having built and implemented these domain planning systems with like an LLM sort of interface, 
everybody wants to know how weather influences the demand for their business, right? Imagine you're not a manufacturer, but you're a restaurant chain and you want to know how many um, people are going to show up to your, your restaurants every hour for every day of the week that you're open so that you can do things like schedule your staff um, and, um, you know, stock your kitchens and so on. The weather drives consumer behavior. And so it's a very, it's a very visible thing. Um, that's why it's where it's at. But weather data is also um, everywhere, right? So and everybody always thinks of, of weather being an important input to these systems. And so it's relatively commoditized, right? So you can basically kind of just configure that um, through a sort of uh, a publicly available API from, from Weather Underground or, or, or elsewhere. Calendar data is even more commoditized. That's why it's um, you know pushed to the right a bit, and it's uh, less visible. Okay, so I want to highlight just a couple of things on why on how the map works. Right, so each of these components are placed, um, and that shows two important things. The first is position, and the second is is movement. And the reason this is a map and not like a graph is because it shows movement. Um, and what I mean by movement is how each of these components um, evolve over time and how they influence each other. And so um, due to natural forces in a competitive marketplace um, and supply and demand and competition and so on, each of these components tend to move to the right. Right. So things, once they're invented over here on the left, if they're useful, they tend to get pushed into uh, basically this middle zone, which is more refined. This is kind of like a product space. So think of your SaaS market. Um, and then and then as they are used more, they get pushed more and more towards the utility and the, the prices drop and so on. Um, but these things are always moving from left to right at different paces. Um, depending on uh, specifics of the component. Position really matters, right? This is what we were talking about on the previous slide, just with, with where it is where it is in vertically and horizontally. Um, and it's important to talk about the mechanics of this because it lets us answer the question we care about ultimately, which is what should we build? What do we configure? What do we buy off the shelf? And... That's why I've created this graph to, to kind of highlight those zones. Um, basically, the further to the left and and uh, it's like altitude on the map, the more likely you are to, to consider buying it. Um, the middle zone is really the configure or um, uh, the configure space. And then the further to the right you go, um, the more likely you, you would be to, to buy these things off the shelf because their commodities, there's really no sense uh, reinventing the wheel. Um, and so you should buy those. Okay, so one of the things I that's important to talk about is why, why this system exists in the first place. Why are we building this system? It could be any other system though. Pick your favorite um, solution. Could be a you know, image processing tool. It could be, um, you know, something that scans PDFs or receipts or something, and then, you know, in, uh, uploads it to some database so that a downstream process can pick it up and, and do something useful with it. It doesn't matter, but there is something um, it exists to do. In this case, with the demand planning um, system, that's to produce healthy working capital. It's not to produce good forecasts. It is to produce healthy cash flow, healthy working capital. Um, manufacturers, restaurants, um, retailers with, with complicated supply chains invest a lot of their assets into their inventory, and that locks it up, right? You're, it makes them uh, less liquid. And so the less you can invest in your inventory, obviously, the more free cash flow you have, the more you can invest it in other things. And the, the the better off you are, so long as you're not compromising the customer experience because you don't have enough of what they want stocked um, and so on. And so you put this at the top of the list, healthy working capital, or put it at the top of the map, excuse me. 
Now, in order to get there, you need all of these system components. Now, what's highlighted on this, this map is all of the non-AI components, right? In the first graph, I showed all of the AI components that were highlighted. In this graph, I'm just emphasizing the, um, the non-AI components, right, that are responsible for producing this healthy working capital. The first thing that you need is the ability to, to track um, and benchmark your current working capital um, to see if the system is actually useful, right? And so in order to uh, do that, you need an ERP integration, which itself needs business logic. Um, you need a uh, basically a very simple CRUD UI or create, read, update, delete, just a very simple application that allows users to actually take action on, in this case, inventory, right? We need seven widgets three weeks from now. And so somebody needs to actually click a button to order seven, uh, let's say couches, so that in three weeks, when consumers come in and, and buy it, they can actually buy one of those seven. So you need a, a UI to actually change the inventory. That itself needs ERP um, integration. ERP integration needs a platform, a platform needs compute and, and compute needs electricity or energy, right? It might be funny to put energy, something so uh, like laughably commoditized on this map, but it's important because it illustrates the, really what drives these technology choices, which is, um, are you going to build it? Of course, nobody's gonna build their own um, like generators to produce electricity, to run their compute, to run their platform. Um, and, and similarly, you wouldn't do that for compute, you wouldn't do that for the platform, but you would do that for ETL, right? And you would do that for your ERP integration. And so following this sequence allows you to see more clearly and more explicitly what you could build versus, uh, versus, versus buy or configure. So um, let's jump into this again. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? If so, feel free to dump them into the chat and I'll uh, respond there. Um, this is kind of an overwhelming map, or it can be. As soon as you understand the mechanics though, um, it can be a really useful tool to figure out where you should invest, right? And, and importantly, where you shouldn't invest. And so it's still not all the way though. It doesn't answer that question entirely. And for that, um, I've tried to codify how I think about this in, um, in this chart, because it, it, I think it very succinctly distills how to arrive at those decisions um, based on a, a map that you made. Um, and really, once you make the map, um, I think you're in a better position to to sort of reason either with yourself or with with your team, with other leaders, um, to figure out um, where you should put your investment. And so, I'll walk through this. But basically, you have three options, right? The first preference would be to buy things off the shelf if it satisfies some conditions and it's aligned with your technology strategy. But really, the preference if if you don't um, if it's not like super custom and it's kind of just whatever technology, but it's needed, buy it off the shelf. It's cheaper. Um, it's, it's reliable. And there are some constraints, but that's preference number one is to buy off the shelf. Preference two would be to build it internally um, for reasons related to ownership and control. Um, and the last preference would be to build with a partner if, um, if certain conditions are true. So those are the three three options you have with, with um, technology. And uh, let's walk through how to get there though. So the first thing that I like to guide clients through is, is, is this component, I should say too, that each, this map is used at the component level, right? So, um, you know, if we take one of these, uh, 
one of these things. So let's say like this, uh, this UI to change the inventory or yeah, we'll take this UI to change the inventory. Should you buy that off the shelf, build it internally or build with a partner? The first question to ask yourself in service of that is, is it a competitive advantage for you to have a UI that allows you to change inventory? The answer depends, there's no right or wrong answer. It just depends on the kind of organization you are and, and your relationship with technology. Um, for a lot of manufacturers, this can be a competitive advantage. The um, supply chain and how you manage it, very important part of profitability in that in that sector. And so you could make a case that it is in fact a competitive advantage. And so you move you move to the next decision point, which is can can I build this in-house? Do I have the staff and skill set to um, build a UI in-house? If you don't, build with a partner. Why versus buying off the shelf? Because it's a competitive advantage and you just can't build it in-house and so build with a partner. Now, let's say you can build it in-house. Um, the next question to ask yourself is if, if you need it fast, right? Do you, do you have a very short time to market? Um, and if not, and you have the skills in-house to build it, well then build internally. But if you do have a tight timeline, then move into the next decision point, which is um, related to cost and how you prefer to structure your costs. So do you prefer to save long-term by investing up front? If not, build internally, right? Um, what that means is you're just, it's, it's gonna be cheaper to build it in-house and it's going to, um, uh, there's like lower upfront capital costs because you're not partnering with somebody. Um, those folks are already on staff and so build it internally. However, if you do want to save um, by investing up front and you have a culture of innovation, that is, it's important to be um, to be bringing to market innovative technology, right? And this happens time and time again in, in our line of work. And what I see with, with customers is often the motivation for a project is we want to demonstrate to our customers, to our investors, to our stakeholders that we, in fact, can deliver on this innovative technology. And so we're going to partner with somebody to, to help do that. Um, that doesn't mean they don't participate at all in the build. They, they can or they don't need to, um, just depending on um, what they prefer. But if, if all of these questions are yes, right, if you, if you can build it in house, but you need it fast and you prefer to save long-term costs by investing up front and you have a culture of innovation, build with a partner. Um, let's say you don't have a culture of innovation though, and you still prefer to save long-term costs by investing up front, you can, you can buy it off the shelf. Um, if we kind of rewind and go back to uh, this first decision point, we started with, is it a competitive advantage? If it's not a competitive advantage, um, the two following decisions, um, are basically if you need customization and flexibility. So it might not be a competitive advantage, but if it needs to be really flexible, um, you know, it's going to be, you should, probably shouldn't buy it off the shelf, um, because they're a little more rigid and constrained in what they can accommodate. And so, um, you know, buy off the shelf, but if, um, if you do need that customization and flexibility, the next question to ask yourself is if, if it impacts the customer experience or something that you think of as being strategic, right? Um, that set of, of activities that, that you consider strategic depends. Um, typically, they affect the customer experience or things really core to what you do as a business. And if so, then you move up into this decision sequence of like, can you build it in-house um, and so on. But if it doesn't impact the customer experience, um, you know, buy it, buy it off the shelf. Um, you could also build it internally, depending on the, the degree of customization that you need um, and really the degree to which it impacts um, your customer experience or, or what you consider as strategically. So I know this is a lot, might be fire hosing you guys. Um, 
this is not a try it's a it's not a uh like hyper prescriptive uh way to make these decisions it's a great starting point though and um it's useful it's useful in in how it makes assumptions explicit and helps you um at least in my experience helps folks see sort of how they're typically making these really important decisions because um as common as the question is you know do i build this do i buy this like should i invest in this should i not invest in this um as common as that is people often don't have um a reliable way of of navigating that and this is is something that we've arrived at after a lot of iteration um with a lot of companies building generative ai technologies um or and really implementing them um to to set uh, really to to you know deliver goals that they care about um this is the last slide and i'm curious if anybody has any questions on everything or anything that we talked about so far If I jump back to this slide, this one might make a sense more now with the context of, of the full map. And so I'll speak to this for a second. Um, over here in utility zone, um, regardless of how visible the technology is, don't build it. It's a utility, right? Um, these things are commoditized and it's often not worth expensive, you know, engineering hours to to build a utility. As you move to the left though, um, that calculus changes. And so if it's very visible um, and well above this minimum like accepted return that you need, um, and it's a relatively stable technology, build it if you can, right? If you have the skills in house, build it if you can. Um, as you move to the left more, but you're still up top, if you have the budget, um, you can more seriously consider building um, more nascent technologies, technologies that um, you don't hear a lot about. There aren't um, options maybe in, in the SaaS uh, marketplace. There's um, maybe there aren't many peers that are peers of yours that are doing this. If you have the budget for that, um, you know, you can be more likely to consider to to build it um, in house. Now, if it's brand new technology, it needs to basically be invented. We did this a lot at Kroger and R and D, where we were doing things that that there weren't known solutions for, and so um, you know that's why you have an R and D department is to invent new tech. We built a lot of stuff because they had a very high tolerance for failure. Um, you know, it is well resourced organization um, and that's where they wanted to put their their resources and so um the the cost of failure wasn't prohibitive now if if the technology is more buried and more invisible you're less likely to say yes to to building it right um and as you move down to this threshold of investment this return that you need, um, you you get into this zone where you can sometimes find a lot of pet projects by various executives um, or leaders, and that's not necessarily bad. Um, it's still right around the the return point. Um, and as you move to the right, though, um, you should be less likely to say yes to building it. Um, and that's why this who's to say you know it's kind of depends on depends on your organization. The really bad pet projects are the utility projects that um, you know somebody's excited about and is choosing to prioritize for some reason. Um, anything below this line, it's uh, should be scrutinized the the choice to to build it. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up there. All of these slides will be made available um, afterwards. Um, we'll send them out, but I hope this. I hope you come away with something somewhat useful and you have a, a framework that you can consider to use when you're um, deciding to invest or not um, in Gen AI.
appreciate the time, everybody. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.